Thank you so much, Dr. Earl, for inviting me and for you guys um, for being here on such a beautiful day. I flew from Boston, so this is like amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, so, right, I'm going to talk to you guys about incomplete networks. And I would very much like to hear about what type of incompleteness you guys are dealing with because knowing what type of incompleteness you are dealing with um, could help you alleviate it. And so if I have time, I'm going to talk about two things. One is limits of learning in incomplete networks. So if I have an incomplete network, like, for example, a contact network, um, can I learn a policy to increase my observability? That is, I have observed an incomplete network. It's partially observed. Can I actually learn a policy about who to go ask questions to increase my observability, for example? And then if I have time, I'm going to talk about tie strength measures, which also have links to um, trying to help you alleviate the incompleteness in your data. So the first set of uh, work that I'm going to talk about is with my graduate students, Tim LaRock and Tim Sakharov, and my postdoc, um, Saheli Badra. So um, if you haven't drank the Kool-Aid, uh, yeah, I'm welcoming you to drink it. Complex networks are ubiquitous, right? You have nodes and you have links connecting them, whether it's technological networks like the internet where you have computers connected to each other, or whether you have information networks here, you're seeing the map of science where a node is a journal, and when a paper in one journal cites a paper in another journal, you see the link. Um, this uh, appendix here is humanities, um, and this is actually a globe. Like, if you actually see it, it's, 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 it's 3D that's been flattened out. And here's computer science and math and ECE. And then, of course, social networks where you guys are very familiar with, like, uh, like friendship networks, or this is the famed um, Hewlett Packard email network, and of course, biological networks like contagion of TB or food network of who eats whom, predator prey. And so the issue is that there are a lot of phenomena in the world that we like to study them, and we want to represent them as a network, right? Nodes connecting each other, showing you some relational dependencies between these entities. And the problem is that Oftentimes, these networks are partially observed, as I mentioned. Now, um, you can try to acquire some data if you have some budget, and that's what I'm going to talk about. That if I had some budget to acquire data, how would I spend my, uh, my, my budget efficiently? Um, and um, th this is basically for when I give this talk at like big web companies, that even if you have a, um, all the data, um, like your Twitter and you have um, the Twitter, what's called the fire hose, all of Twitter, it may be too much data. And so you will downsample it. And by downsampling it, now you have in, uh, introduced some incompleteness into it. And just to be uh, crystal clear, if this is the fully observed network, which is a complete network where every node is connected to each other, but this is what you have observed, and I ask you for average degree, which is two times the number of, vert uh, two times the number of edges divided by the number of vertices, you're going to give me the wrong answer, right? And so uh, the fact that your network is partially observed introduces biases that you need to watch out for. So the research question that we are answering is given a network that was partially observed and limited resources, so a, a budget, to acquire more data, how can you get the biggest bang for your buck? That's what we are um, talking about. Now, there are two approaches here. This problem is um, oftentimes referred to as either network completion or network discovery. So there are people who say, oh, I'm not going to use my budget to collect data. I'm going to assume that my data is coming from a particular model, like a chronic or graph model or a stochastic uh, block model, and I have observed some data. I'm going to use my data and what I know about the model that's generating my data to learn the sufficient statistics, learn the parameters, and then I can fill the rest of the network. So um, this is, has been very popular. These are some of the papers that I like. Um, they're not from my group that I cite. Um, so for example, the Kim and Leskovich paper, um, this Leskovich is Yuri Leskovich at Stanford, um, 
assume that data com is coming from the chronicograph model. I have seen some observations, and what I want to do is I want to learn the parameters to seed the chronicograph model, and so I use a method like expectation maximization. What we've been working on is, no, I have some budget, and I want to go collect some data. So we've been working on two things. One is, can I estimate some statistics from a partially observed network? So can I have an unbiased estimator of uh, the degree distribution or um, the uh, number of triangles that are in my graph or uh, average number of triangles per degree? Um, that's been one. The other one has been, can I actually either learn or utilize an explore exploit model um, to increase the observability of my uh, data. And I'm going to focus on um, the second one, which is um, can I utilize an explore-exploit approach to collect more data and reduce my, um, my partial observability? Um, and I'm going to talk about limits of learning within the setup. At the very end, I'll have one slide on the multi-arm bandits. I very much like multi-arm bandits, so I'll talk a little bit about that. So there are issues to consider when you decide to actually spend your money or your time to go collect data, right? So the first one is what are your goals, right? Is your goal uh, that after you spend, let's say, $500, uh, you have brought in as many nodes of type X, that you have now more um, black gay men in the south side of Chicago in your network? Um, is your goal to just close triangles? You have uh, observed the network or a series of networks, like a series of egonets and you just want to make sure to close those triangles? Or is your goal to actually learn a function on the network itself? So I want to use my budget to get a sample where at the end of my, when I spend my budget, that sample I can send it to a classifier and have a very good um, node classifier. Right? So this is actually one of the things that we're working with right now with MIT Lincoln Labs where they're interested in learning functions on a network, and they know that this network is partially observed, and they're like, okay, I'm going to spend some budget to increase my network, but I want to increase it in a way where at the end, when I spend all my budget, I have the best classifier for nodes um, that I can get for this budget. Um, so a classifier would be like, is a node red or blue or green, if, uh, you know, in that kind of sense. Um, and they're interested on, on anomaly detection. That's why it's there. So that's one. What is your goal? Um, because that directly links to whatever reward you decide um, to use to learn a policy. The other one is what kind of access model um, do, you, do you have? So again, you, you're going to spend some money. Uh, you're either going to go to an oracle, which is going to cost a lot of money, right? So if you go out and you're asking people, maybe that will require a lot of time and money. Or you go to an API, right? You go to a Twitter API or some other API and ask questions. So what kind of questions can you ask and what kind of answers do you get? So for example, uh, when I ask about Tina, do I get all of Tina's friends? Uh, when I ask about Tina, do I get a random K of Tina's friends? Do I just get the last person that Tina talked to? Or, for example, when I ask about Tina and Bob, I actually get the communication channel between Tina and Bob, and everything that has happened between Tina and Bob, I get that. So depending on what access model you have, that will also impact whether you can learn a policy, what kind of policy you want to learn, and um, also, um, um, certain pitfalls that you have to look, look for. Um, the other one is the accuracy of your access models. So there are cases in which, for example, uh, the responses may be inaccurate, or the responses could be noisy, or uh, there may be deliberate error in there. I had a teleconference with Dr. Aral, and we were talking about how in sexual contact networks, when you go and do these field studies, maybe the person will not tell you certain people that they have had contact with, or um, they don't know. Uh, it was an anonymous kind of a, um, 
interaction. And so, or for example, if somebody, I test somebody and that person is tested negative, then they become a leaf, they become dead end, and I can't ask about them, right? So these all introduce biases in terms of um, your network and, for example, the dangling edges that you will, you will have. Um, so these are three different things. So what is your goal? What is your access model? And what kind of accuracy do you have in terms of when you go to the access model and try to ask some questions to get more data? Now, the network completion problem is not link prediction. So it is not just that, oh, it's Tina friends with Bob. Uh, in many cases, what you want to do is you want to bring in new nodes into your network. Um, and in many cases, it's actually this thing of, I have a network that has a boundary, and I have these um, leaves, these uh, spikes that go out of this boundary, and I want to know which people, like how does the subgraph grow from that boundary? And so there are new nodes that you want to bring in. So it's not simply link prediction. There's a really nice paper about theoretical justifications of uh, link prediction, which um, the URL is up there. And actually, the slides are on my website. I can give you the link at the end. Uh, this is not graph sampling, um, because you already have a sample of the graph, <laughs> right? And you don't usually know how that sample was collected. At least like in my um, field, what happens is you go to a website where there's all these networks, and you just like have a dump of those networks, and you say, oh, my algorithm works on these networks, without even knowing how those networks were actually sampled. So it's not directly sampling. So there's a really good tutorial uh, that was uh, done on network sampling um, back in 2015 by Jennifer Neville, who's a professor at Purdue University. And again, that's the link to, um, to her um, tutorial slides. And this is not network inference. So network inference is uh, you have seen um, some uh, contagion propagating through uh, your people, but from that you want to infer the underlying network. Um, so there's work there. This is, again, not that, where I saw, like, Tina had the flu, then Bob had it, then John had it, then Peter had it, and I want to see where this path is in a bigger network, right? Um, so this is also not that. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is actually very close to respondent-driven sampling. Uh, the issue there is that they really want to do this thing called link tracing, where, uh, as I understand it, and I'm not a statistician, they bring people in to the clinic, they give them coupons, and then these people go out into their um, communities and they distribute the coupons, and then somebody with a coupon comes back again to the clinic and so on and so forth, and they do this kind of link tracing. Um, we are not trying to grow a tree. We are actually trying to grow our network given, given a budget. So our framework um, is called the Network Online Learning. Um, so we want to grow the network um, through sequential optimal queries. And if I am uh, learning um, to grow my network for a particular function, which is a supervised learning or a classification on this network, it also falls under online active learning. Uh, just a buzzword if you've heard about active learning, that's where it falls. Um, we try to be agnostic to data distributions and also how um, the uh, data was sampled. Um, it is relatively easy to guess if the data was sampled by a random node or a random edge selection versus uh, some kind of a crawl or a random walk selection. So if you collect your data with just random edge selection, Tina called Bob, John called Jane, so on and so forth, and you don't make the induced um, subgraph, you don't connect it into a big graph, then you get this incomplete network, which is lots of um, uh, independent disjoint dyads. Um, and so, and if it's random node selection, also you tend to get many more connected components, these different subgraphs um, that, that you would expect to have more connectivity between them uh, versus in a crawl, like a, like a breath first search or snowball sampling, or even a random walk, you start from a couple of seeds and you're walking this graph 
you tend to um, get more connectivity. So it's easier to figure out whether your data was coming from a random uh, node or edge or this kind of a crawl. And so we try to be agnostic to sampling methods. And then for us, one of the things that is important is that whatever approach we use, um, that the approach is interpretable. That is, if I learn a policy, I can actually go and talk to somebody and say, these are the features that I'm using, and this is what my policy is uh, in terms of how you should go collect your data is saying. So as opposed to, for example, having tons and tons of input into, for example, a deep network and trying to just crank the system for getting really good predictions of who to go ask, we really care about oh, I'm actually going to learn a policy. For those of you who are statisticians, for example, it, it, you would think, oh, she's doing some kind of regression, right, where I can actually explain, for example, what these features are and which ones are more important and which ones are less important. So what do we assume, right? So we assume that I know um, the API access model. That is, when I go and ask for data, I, the person is telling me, I'm giving you everything about Tina or, or I'm giving you only um, uh, like a random sampling of, of Tina's neighbors, or I'm only going to give you just one edge, right? But I know what that access model is. Um, we are, for now, the results I'm going to show you, assuming that the underlying network is static, so we can um, deal with um, edge and node addition. Um, deletion is a bit harder, that an edge uh, and, and its links existed and no longer exist. So we are assuming that the network is static or you're just adding to it. Um, and then, um, so we are not assuming that people die, for example, in a network. Uh, now, what we do not assume is we do not assume an underlying model for um, the data generation, right? Um, we're going uh, with my, uh, one of the professors at, at Wisconsin, George Box, who famously said, all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? I don't know what process, what model is generating the data. Usually there are multiple ones and they're complex and you don't know um, how much each is contributing to the data generation. And then we don't, uh, we don't assume that we know how the initial sample was collected. So I don't know whether um, this, network that you are giving me, which is incomplete, how, how that came about. Um, and so the framework is you give me an incomplete network. I'm going to label that as g hat zero for time t zero, right? Uh, I have a probing budget. Uh, this probing budget would be, for example, I ask about a node, if that is what my API access model tells. Uh, I have a reward function that is tied to the goal I have. So this reward function basically maps an action to a real number where an action is ask about Tina and then the reward is, okay, how much do I now know about what is happening in this phenomenon given that I asked about Tina, right? How many um, black men with HIV did Tina bring into the network because I asked about Tina, right? Um, and so... Uh, then what happens is we sequentially probe this incomplete network uh, in order to maximize our cumulative reward. And then at the end, you output your, uh, your network, the G hat B, or you output the network and the function that you uh, were trying to learn. So uh, back to the research question, I have a budget and I want to get my biggest bang for the buck. And as you can imagine, this depends on the network structure. So if I have a uh, network and I am interested in its degree distribution and I have this spectrum from homogeneous degree distribution to heterogeneous degree distribution, uh, when can I learn uh, and when should I just use a heuristic? A heuristic would be just good enough and when there is potential for learning. So as you can imagine, if I have an erdos rainy random graph, a GNP model where I have a little n number of nodes and the nodes are connected to each other with probability P, the only thing that I can learn if I'm lucky is that it's random, right? <laughs> I cannot learn anything else. Um, that's in terms of homogeneous degree distribution where learning is not useful. 
in the heterogeneous degree distribution, this is where you have a network where there is one dominant process. So if you have, for example, a preferential attachment network, um, something like a barabashi alber network, where when a node comes, it gravitates toward a star, um, then you don't need to do learning because the idea is that, well, if you all have a high degree in my sample, uh, you have a lot of neighbors, you have a lot of friends, then it's likely that you are also going to have a lot of friends in the general population if I had seen all of the network. And so I don't need to spend time learning or spend time collecting data um, because there is a dominant process that's happening in terms of collection of this data. And so the potential learning is in this middle where you happen to have a heterogeneous degree distribution. So you may have a degree distribution with a heavy tail, you have a few stars, um, but you also have this rich, rich structure, something like uh, you have triangles. And in fact, one of the things which is interesting is how the uh, process of preferential attachment, wanting to connect to a star, interacts with closing of the triangles, right? So a lot of the uh, network graph models uh, where you want to generate a synthetic graph uh, and you say, oh, my synthetic graph is faithful to the graphs I observe, to the networks I observe in the real life, is how do you combine those two? How do you combine um, the heavy tail degree distribution with um, the correct distribution of average number of triangles per degree, right? So if I look at all of my nodes who have 10 uh, friends, what is the average number of triangles around them? So, but anyways, here's where, where there is potential for learning. And so I'm just gonna show you some pictures to, um, for you to look at these kinds of distributions. So the ER, that's the erdos rainy um, graph. This is a GMP graph. It's the blue stars that you see. The orange circles are block two level erdos rainy graphs. Um, these are, are generated as follows. You have a bunch of random erdos rainy graphs, and each erdos rainy graph is dense, and then you connect them in a uh, heavy-tailed way. So there are going to be dense erdos rainy graphs where they have a lot of connections into them, and then there are ones that don't have a lot of connections into them. The block two level or just rainy uh, random graphs were, um, uh, were invented in Sandia National Laboratory by Tammy Kolda and Ali Pinar. Um, and um, for my money right now, they're the most faithful um, synthetic graphs that we have. And then there is the BA model, that's the barabashi alber model, which are these empty uh, green circles. And what you're seeing here, this is the degree distribution uh, and uh, this is the, um, the clustering coefficient, um, uh, the, the, the distribution over clustering coefficients. So, so, so basically you can do learning in the orange one. Um, you can actually learn a policy in the orange one. So the NOL algorithm, and you don't need to read the algorithm. I'm a computer scientist. I like to put up algorithms. Uh, there are five steps. Um, the first step is you observe a state. At every time point, you have a graph. You observe a state. Um, and by observing a state, it means you compute your features on that space. You have these regression weights. And again, you can plug in whatever uh, supervised learning algorithm that you like. We have um, the, uh, we're using uh, online regression. Uh, it's fast and it gives us interpretability. Um, you choose an action based on your current state and the, and the features and the weights on those features. You actually take an action. Uh, you ask about Tina. Tina brings in some people into the network. Tina reduces the, uh, the partial uh, uh, observability of the network. And you collect the reward for asking about Tina because Tina brought in these 10 people, right? Uh, and then you update your parameters. Um, these are the weights on the regression model. We are using the online linear regression that was published in NeurIPS uh, 2008. And then you repeat until your budget is, uh, is depleted, right? Really simple. At every time I, I have my nodes, I compute my features, I have some weights about what, um, how important are these features. Now, one of the things about um, this framework, as you can see, is that um, you can substitute whatever features you want, 
and you can substitute whatever supervised approach that you want. And for those of you who know a little bit about uh, reinforcement learning, this should make you think about Q learning, right? There's a temporal difference that's going on. At time T0, I have a guess about how good Tina is. I ask about Tina at time T1, now I know how good Tina was, and I'm learning that difference, right? So, oh, and the one thing here is that if what you are interested in, so if, for example, you are trying to bring in as many nodes as possible, and you know that your, um, your, so your, your reward there would be how many new nodes did Tina bring into the network, and you know that your degree distribution is heavy-tailed, then you can't just straight up use the regression, right? You have to use a regression that takes into account that what you want to learn is actually a heavy-tailed degree distribution. Right? And so there are all these approaches of like median of means where you segment your data into multiple portions, you learn multiple weights, and then you take the median of those weights. Um, there's that. And then I've been using the term policy. So the policy is that after the B budget, I have these weights on these features. The features, I know what they mean, and I can come to you and say, Oh, the policy is to go after people who, you know, have a, a degree uh, uh, between this much, they have this much triangles, and so on and so forth, right? So that would be the policy in terms of which features are the most important. Um, the other thing is, um, this is something that we had observed, especially if what you're interested in, your goal, has a, degree to, has a distribution that's heavy-tailed, whether you can actually reduce the, the exploration. So there is an exploration versus exploitation step where there's a probability you, you flip a coin and you say, okay, do I go with what the model that I'm learning is saying, ask about Tina, or do I ask for just anybody in the network? Um, and if you cannot reduce this P to zero and you always have an element of exploration, then you're really not learning a policy. <laughs> Because part of your policy is I'm always going to explore, right? Uh, and so for us, the meaning of learning a policy is where I can crank this probability P down to zero, right? That perhaps initially I start with like 30% exploration, but over time I can decay that probability of exploration. And so if you like uh, to think about like Markov decision processes or, 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 or sequential decision making, I have this agent, I know he looks like um, Eva uh, from <laughs> Wally. Um, uh, so, so Eva uh, takes an action, for example, by asking about a particular node. Um, there's this environment. Uh, when Eva acts in this environment, the state changes. You go to another graph. Uh, there's some reward that is being collected, and then that gets back to the agent, and you, you go over and over again. Uh, one of the things that we're doing now is trying to extend this approach, which is a Markov decision process, to a POM DP, to a partially observed Markov decision process, where for every state you have some kind of a belief and you take the beliefs into account. So let me um, show you some concrete results. Uh, so we started with five features that we understood uh, and we could explain to others. Uh, one is what is the in-sample degree? So the idea being that, for example, nodes that have high degree in the samples, maybe we expect them to have high degree in the, in the underlying uh, fully observed network. Uh, we look at uh, in-sample clustering coefficient. This is basically how many, how many triangles you have around the node, which indicates the density uh, around a particular node. We look at the size of the connected component uh, basically, the idea being that uh, if a component is bigger than others, then maybe I have exploited that component enough, and I need to explore some of, for example, the, the, the next largest connected component. Uh, we have the fraction of your neighbors that have been probed. This is another signal in terms of how, how, how much have I identified around you and whether I should go and look elsewhere. And then the other thing that we have is this idea of a lost reward, where we don't want the ordering to have an impact in terms of how much reward you get. So just because you asked me in time step 
uh, 100. Uh, and so I don't bring in as many new nodes because in the previous time steps, you asked other people that brought nodes that I could have as easily brought in. Um, I don't want to get penalized for that. And so we take that into account in terms of what is the loss reward of you having asked me um, in, in time step 100 as opposed to early on. So these simple five features. So what happens? Um, I told you what our hypotheses were, were uh, where, in, uh, where you have a homogeneous degree distribution, there's an erdos rainy model uh, for the potential for learning as this block two level erdos rainy model, and then for the heterogeneous degree distribution is this uh, barabashi albert model. Um, so the first thing to do is to check to see if your hypotheses actually hold, right, the scientific method. Um, yeah, so in erdos rainy um, nobody can learn, right? They all do the same. So uh, this is, the red is the random selection of, of nodes at every time you randomly pick a node. A low is you pick the lowest degree node. Um, High, the orange is you pick the highest degree node at every time step, and this is NOL, um, the network online learning, where we start P at 0.3. So we start the uh, exploration rate, rate at 0.3. And they all do the same. So doing learning didn't add anything. Um, then there's the Barabashi Alber model. This is where we know that asking the, the high degree node is is the best thing to do. And so the x-axis is time, so this is budget, right? So 5,000 is, uh, you asked about 5,000 people, right? And uh, this is cumulative award being here was um, just bring in as many new nodes as possible, so higher is better. And so here you see that just asking about the lowest degree node has the, the least performance, then it's random, um, then it's us, but the learning model does catch up with the optimal model, and then there's the high degree. And this is, again, a, a case where you know what process is generating the data, right? So you could just use a heuristic because you already know what's happening. And then there's the BTER model, where this is the block two level erdos rainy models, where you have interesting degree distribution and you happen to have modularity and again, um, the x-axis is the budget, um, the y-axis is how many new nodes you brought in, higher is better, and this is where there is a potential for learning. And again, the blue is uh, the network online learning. Again, we start at, um, at the acceleration rate of 0.3, and then you diminish that. Um, so that's where learning is feasible. Uh, we looked at um, some networks, some of them where we knew the complete network. So when you are actually trying to do some evaluation uh, in machine learning and supervised setting, you need to know, you need to have some ground truth, right? So these are um, um, relatively small networks where we actually have the complete network. Like I know the exact co-authorship network, right? And I know the exact citation network. Uh, with CADA, this is Internet Autonomous uh, Systems Network. And we put this in because this is one where it's really um, preferential attachment. And again, we wanted to check and see whether our, our hypothesis holds in a real network that has a preferential attachment process. And so uh, we observed what I um, had promised you in terms of the hypothesis where, um, again, these are the number of probes, the budget that you have, and this is the average reward, the higher being better, and the learning, uh, you can actually learn a policy of, of how to query, which nodes to go after to, um, to increase your network. Uh, and again, with CADA, this is where it's really um, a, a preferential attachment kind of network. And so the, um, the issue here, you may ask, okay, of the features that you had, which of the features were the most, uh, most interesting or had the highest weight? And the ones uh, that were the most interesting had the highest, highest weight was the in uh, sample degree and um, the fraction of probed neighbors. So how many of your neighbors had I probed already for these experiments where I, my reward is bring in as many new nodes as possible? Depending on the reward, it can, it, your, your features can, can be different. Their importance can be different. So 
So um, just a quick wrap up on this because I want to move on to other things. Um, so basically, before you spend your money and use machine learning, I know it's very popular these days, you need to know whether I can actually learn in this setting or not, right? And so we, we had this assumption of having very minimal assumptions of, for example, uh, the process that's generating the data or how the data was generated. In many cases, you don't know how the data was sampled. Um, you can learn whether it was a random sample or whether it was a crawl, but above and beyond that, you do not know. Um, and so what we focused on was actually the two processes that are dominant. One was degree distribution, and one is, one is whether you have um, communities, basically m m modularity in the network, and where it's useful and where it's not. Um, and that uh, for certain cases where there is an optimal heuristic, we can actually learn um, uh, that optimal heuristic. So I want to show you a takeaway slide for this before I move on. And this is the takeaway slide. So the takeaway slide is um, that if you have a, um, uh, I think this thing had some bubbles that didn't come, come out. But if, if you have uh, a graph, and you can test it for its fit, if it's erdish rainy, if it has low modularity and, and, and homogeneous degree distribution, then learning is not useful. Um, if you have heterogeneous degree, like a heavy tail degree distribution, uh, and low mo modularity, that is not as much clustering in your network, then just go with an optimal heuristic. And the potential for learning is where you have the heterogeneous degree distribution and you ha happen to have fairly noticeable clustering. Um, and so these are, for example, some of the other networks that we tried the same Enron email network, uh, a, a Twitter social network, where learning can actually happen. And so what we're doing now is trying to come up with limits of detectability, where you can actually, for example, say, you know, it's, you I can actually have like real numbers, right? Like in terms of the exponent of the degree distribution, plus and minus this much, this is how much learning you can do. And then, um, I wanted to say something about also the multi-arm bandit approach, uh, which may be interesting uh, to this community. Um, and what that is is, um, so for those of you who don't know about multi-arm bandit, is as follows. Um, I'm a gambler, and I'm sitting in front of all these slot machines, and what I want to do is win as much as possible. And the question is, which arm do I pull? Right? And do I go with a slot machine that has been giving me more and more coins, or do I explore? Right? Um, so it has a similar setup to, oh, I have all these nodes, I have all these people, which one do I ask? Do I ask the person who's been giving me a lot of good information, or do I go and ask a, a random person? And so one of the things that we did, and I apologize for this, again, this, this symbol didn't come across, it's Epsilon WGX, um, where uh, we, we have a multi arm bandit approach uh, but it's a nested approach where initially you make a decision, do I want to densify the part of the network that I've seen, or do I want to explore, and do I want to expand my network? Then at the second stage, you're like, okay, now what do I do if I want to densify? Do I explore or exploit under this densification? One of the problems that we have seen and others have seen, like folks at University of Massachusetts, um, Krista Gile, who is a physician there, has seen, is that most of these approaches that try to grow the network by asking um, uh, for new data, they tend to become uh, um, uh, blind. That is, they, they have this tunnel vision, uh, like a horse with the, with the guards. And so you, you need to trade off this densification versus uh, versus expansion. The framework I talked uh, about at the beginning, which is very flexible, the network online learning, um, the whole densification versus expansion is built into the parameter P in terms of exploration or exploitation. And so you don't ex have to actually, in a sense, engineer this two-step approach. Um, so I want to use the rest of my time, I know I have about like uh, 17 more minutes, to talk about this other work that has links to the first work that I talked about. This is with my um, 
graduate student, Mangesh Gupta. I was a professor at Rutgers University before I moved, and he was there uh, with me. So the problem is as follows. I have, in many real world setup, what I actually have is I don't see a unipartite network. I don't see the friendship network. What I see are people going to events, people going to parties, right? And so the question is from this network, what I want to do is I want to infer an implicit weighted social network, right? Now, of course, this implicit weighted social network can also be incomplete because my original bipartite or two-mode graph is incomplete. But all the work that I talked about in the first part of, the, of this lecture um, uh, is taking into account that you have a unipartite graph that you, it doesn't look at a bipartite network. Um, and so, uh, so our, our motivation for this was that um, there are a lot of cases where you actually don't see the unipartite network, you're seeing a bipartite network. And usually, for example, what people do is they do common neighbor where um, they say, okay, I have a network, I have the adjacency matrix, Tina is friends, uh, um, Tina wrote this paper, Bob wrote this paper, right? I have an adjacency matrix A for the bipartite network and I multiply it by its transpose, right? Um, and also there are certain setups where you can, um, you can, for example, if Tina has, has 4,000 friends on Facebook, what does friendship mean in that setup, right? So you want to figure out which links are important and which links are not important. So um, I think probably a lot of you know about tie strength. This is the idea that I want to be able to rank the edges in the network, or I want to be able to at least rank Tina's edges. Um, and as I was saying, a, a simple approach is common neighbor. And um, Mangesh really liked Shakespeare. So what he did was he looked at Macbeth and he looked at all the characters in Macbeth and all the scenes in Macbeth. And if this character was in the scene, he would connect it to that scene, right? And what he did was he um, sent that network to the simple tie strength function, which says that um, go over all the people that share this scene and give them a tie strength of one over the number of people in that scene. Right, and so, uh, so for for here, for example, you see that Lady Macbeth and Macbeth have a very heavy tail, have a very heavy weight for them. And again, the reason this is connected to the other work is that perhaps the people that are very connected to each other, they're highly correlated, um, highly correlated. That could be a feature that I can I can learn on. So the issue here is that there are lots and lots of um, of tie strength measures out there. And so which one should you use, right? Uh, do you use all of them? Do you use some of them? Uh, what do you do? And so what we did was we, we came up with an axiomatic approach where we were like, what would we like a tie strength function to do? And then try to categorize um, the existing tie strength measures in terms of whether they satisfy these axioms or not. Um, and so the good thing about an axiomatic approach is that if I can prove a characterization theorem, then if Joe comes in with a new tie strength function, then I can rewrite his tie strength functions in the same characters and compare formulas as opposed to run an empirical study. So again, the problem is I have given this, uh, this bipartite or two-mode network, and I want to find the underlying uh, network. And so instead of being able to find the underlying weighted network, what you really um, can do with, an, with axioms is to come up with a partial ordering in terms of uh, who is um, the closest to whom and who is the farthest away from whom. And I'll, and I'll discuss why you can't come up with a total ordering in a bit. So we came up with uh, eight axioms. And you may say, why eight axioms? Uh, the reason is that uh, we needed to prove a characterization theorem, and these eight um, allowed us to prove a characterization theorem. So the first one was isomorphism, which is that I, um, I am going to say that the tie strength between two people are the same um, just based on the topology of the network. I don't know that Tina is married to Brandon, right? I I'm just observing the events that they go to, right? So here, for example, uh, B uh, and C and D and E and C and E and B and D, they all have the same tie strength 
because in what I observed, they all went uh, to a party that uh, three people attended. So B, um, C, and D, they all attended Q, and then C, D, and E all attended R's party. So that's one. The other one is that you need to have some kind of a baseline. So when there are no events, what is the tie strength of two people? And so we had this thing that if there are no events, then the tie strength between me and Bob is zero, right? Uh, clearly, there, there's no other. Um, and then the other one was some kind of an upper bound where it says that if uh, there are only two people and they only attended one party, uh, then their, their tie strength is one. So we want to have, we want to be able to normalize this this tie strength measure. Um, the other two are axioms of frequency and intimacy. Th these are actually really interesting where, and this is also why there's a cottage industry here. Frequency says that the more events I go with you, the stronger uh, my tie is to you. Um, and this is all other things being equal. Um, and of course, frequency comes from social psychology. They call it familiarity effect. Now, in social psychology, they talk about whether my experience with you was positive or negative. Um, so we take that away, right? So computer scientists are very good at bastardizing things. So we're not looking at whether um, my interactions with you were positive. It's just that I see Tina with Bob all the time, right, in many, many events. Um, the other one is intimacy, right, that smaller events create stronger ties, the, the idea being of attention, right? So if it's just you and me at lunch, then all of you have all of my attention versus if it's you and me in a conference hall, then there's like 100 people and so my attention and hence my tie to you gets reduced. Again, this is all other things being equal. Um, then there's popularity. Uh, so the idea with popularity is that it's just that um, larger events create more ties, right? So if you go to a conference, that there are a thousand people there, um, there are a lot more opportunities for you to become friends with people. Um, and then uh, the last two are uh, basically that your tie strength with people only depends on events I observe you going to. So the first one says that Tina's tie to other, so, so Tina's ties to other people only depends on the events that Tina attended. I don't know why Tina didn't go to Bob's party, and I don't want to guess about it, right? So I only look at the things that I did see. And then if I'm, only, if I'm interested in two people, Tina and Bob, then I'm only interested in, um, in events that they both attended. Um, and this is where you can already uh, probably uh, infer that what we're looking at is a monotonically increasing function, that over time, Tina's um, tie strength to Bob increases um, if they attend a lot of mutual, uh, mutual parties. Um, and then the last one is submodularity. This is a bit of a misnomer, but the idea being that um, the marginal increase in my tie strength with you for a particular event is at most the tie that I get um, with you for that particular event. So, if I had a particular tie, uh, um, strength of tie with you at time G, um, and now the event Q happens, then the difference between those ties is going to be less than or equal to the tie I'm getting with you just for that particular event. So one of the cool things with these axioms is that just given these eight axioms, if you give me a bipartite network, I can give you a partial order, and I can explain that partial order to you, right? So in this small cartoonish example, the reason A, B, and C, D have the highest tie strength is because of axioms of intimacy and frequency. And because A, C, A, D, and all these have the lowest are because of the baseline, which would normalize the measure, and the conditional independence of vertices and of events. So that is cool. And we feel like these axioms are very intuitive, but a lot of the previous tie strength approaches will break it. And a lot of them have to do with the fact that they assign a tie strength for you to me because, um, because of our mutual friends and them having gone to mutual events. Now, one of the reasons that there's all this um, 
problems with lots and lots of tie strength measures, and this is, again, one of the other reasons I, I usually push this axiomatic approach, is that we now understand why there's a cottage industry of these tie strength measures, and it has to do with intimacy versus frequency. And so I'd like to give this example. There's scenario one, Mary and Susan go to two parties where they're the only um, people there. Scenario two, Mary, Susan, and Jane go to three parties, and they're the only people there. In which scenario is Mary's tie to Susan stronger? Now, you may say, I don't care, but this is a cottage industry, both in academia and in industry, in terms of how close is somebody to another person, for example, for recommendation or anything else. So this is why there is a cottage industry in trying, trying to figure out strength of ties. So, and each time strength measure uh, breaks it, uh, breaks this trade-off for its own way. So, for example, with common neighbor, uh, what it does is it um, it likes frequency more than intimacy. So it gives it gives frequency a stronger tie than than intimacy. And there's a characterization theorem. I won't go through the characterization theorem. I am I see the time. Um, but basically what the characterization theorem is saying is that if I have a bipartite network and if you give me a tie strength function that satisfies those eight axioms, then what I can do is I can take your tie strength function and break it down into two functions. One is H and one is G, where H is this monotonically, in, uh, monotonically decreasing function, which is how much tie strength do I get um, um, to you for sharing a particular event with you. And G is a monotonically increasing submodular function that over time, how do these, um, these tie strengths compound? And so if we go back to all the tie strength measures, uh, you can actually break them into the self-referential ones and the non-self-referential ones. So the self-referential ones are, for example, um, you can have the CATS measure, which says that it's my tie strength with you depends on the number of paths between you and me, and it's, it's, uh, it's discounted exponentially by the length of those paths. For the ones that satisfy the eight axioms, then I can look at their G and H and see what they're doing. So a lot of them... Basically, for each common event that we attend, they are, they're summing um, the, the tie strings we have. Um, we added this maximum, which is of all the events that you and I attended, what is the maximum tie strength in this set? And I'll pick that one. And then a lot of them that you see are like a simple function of n. With common neighbor, it's just constant that you and I were there, and it doesn't matter how many people were there. But for example, with linear, it's just one over the number of people that are there. Um, and so this is where, for example, maybe I can learn a tie strength function um, as opposed to um, just go with, uh, with what um, somebody else has decided the function form for a particular tie strength for a common event is. And then a lot of the other ones that are popular, like SimRank, which is measures my similarity to you, my tie strength to you, based on the tie strength of our friends, they don't satisfy the independence assumptions, right? That, uh, for example, that you and I um, have had to be in that party. Otherwise, uh, uh, it wouldn't give us any tie strength. Um, there is, so as I said, our, our axioms are, will give you a partial order, and um, we are, we're all about ranking applications. Uh, so who is the first person that, that is the closest to Tina in terms of similarity? Um, and if you want to get a total order, then you would need to do a linear extension of that partial order. And uh, we have a theorem about that. You can look at it um, in the paper. Um, I want to show you also some results here before I finish. Uh, so we looked at some data sets. There is a Southern Women data set, which is very popular among sociologists. Uh, where I guess there are 18 Southern women who go to parties. Um, there are the, the Shakespearean data sets because um, Mangish likes Shakespeare. And then these are the uh, real world networks of Enron email where like here's, here are the people and here are the fact that there's an email and these people belong to that email, right? Are the two from or CC. Or the reality blue my, uh, uh, the, the Bluetooth is um, here are the people and here are the connections between their Bluetooth. So if you're going to do an axiomatic approach, the first thing to do is um, to look at the number of ties um, that are not resolved by whatever method that you are, are 
are pushing, right? So we're pushing this partial order of the axioms. And one of the things that we see is uh, that for the methods that actually do take into account uh, friends of friends here, um, the incomparable pairs are rather small, right? Now, you may say, why are there so many tie pairs? The networks you showed us were rather small. The reason being is there's a tie and a pair, so it's n choose two and then two out of that. So there are lots of different pairs that you need to look at. Um, but the coverage is good because um, there's not that many uh, incomparable pairs. So the first takeaway for this would be that um, because there's not that many tie pairs that are different between the methods that are computationally more expensive than ours. Um, the other one is what are the number of conflicts between the partial order and the tie string functions that don't satisfy our axioms? And again, smaller is better, and we see that they are, the percentages are small. So Jacquard and temporal proportional do not satisfy the axioms. Temporal proportional is basically saying that I spent time uh, that is proportional to my tie strength with you at your party. Uh, and so the number of conflicts is small between our axioms and um, the functions that don't satisfy the axioms. And so if you put the two together, then if you have a ranking applications where you, you have Tina and you have all these other people and Tina goes to parties with these people and you want to rank them uh, from who is, uh, has the closest tie to Tina to who has the, the least tie to Tina, this is where it's applicable. And so somebody like Common Neighbor would just work as well. Um, so I just want to summarize, because um, I see I'm at 2 o'clock. So one is your network data is in complete beware, as Dr. Rural mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and so if you are doing analysis on that um, few data, you can get uh, um, wrong, the wrong results. And the major first fork is, are you going to assume that your data is coming from a model or whether you're not going to assume that your data is coming from a model and you're going to collect some data and try to use some kind of exploration and exploitation and then try to reduce the exploration and actually learn a policy. And then for the tie strength, um, the idea is that I feel like at least based on my discussions with uh, Dr. Oral, this is, um, you, you guys operate in a setting where you can actually sit down and come up with some axioms. And so using an axiomatic approach to be able to reduce the incompleteness of your uh, of the data uh, may be somewhere to look into. Uh, and actually, this work, we, we also worked with, with Washington Post. Uh, yes, the newspaper company, they had a social reader. And so we had a lot of uh, friendships and also who read which articles to try to uh, predict who's close with whom. In terms of future work and open problems, one is you know, full-fledged reinforcement learning. One of the issues is how much credit do I give to Tina for bringing in Bob, because then Bob brings in this all other people. And if I hadn't asked Tina, Bob wouldn't have come into the network, right? So this idea of assigning credit and also this idea of delayed reward for somebody. Um, and so if your rewards are non-stationary, which oftentimes in complex spaces there are, um, where the reward uh, function that you're learning for, actually that distribution changes, makes your life more difficult. Um, the other one is uh, transfer learning. So if I actually learn on a contact network in Luxembourg, can I pick that policy and use it in France, assuming that France and Luxembourg have similar cultures. Um, also, whether I can make some guarantees in terms of the learnable settings, right? So if your network has, um, you know, the, the exponent is between two and three, uh, the exponent of the degree distribution, and the slope of the average number of triangles versus degree is like 1.6, then I can guarantee that I will be off by this much in terms of accuracy given a budget of, of 1,000, right? So this idea of like bringing in some of the ideas from computational learning theory and sample complexity. Um, there are hybrid mechanisms. So for example, if you have a um, uh, partially observed network, you could try to find the best model that fits it and use a combination of data gathering 
and oh, here's the best model among all the models that I know that fits it. And so uh, putting the two approaches together of not gathering data and gathering data. Um, the idea about handling incomplete dynamic graphs so people die and how does that affect things? As I said, like we can handle people being added, but we can't handle people dying. Um, and then the last one is uh, how would you do network uh, completion in presence of adversaries? So uh, part of this work is being funded by um, the Army, and so they're very interested in terms of uh, people who actively want to give you um, errors, <laughs> right? Uh, where, for example, I am an adversary in your network, and I know that if I fall into a community that is quote unquote hot, you're going to scrutinize me. So I want to move myself into a community that is not hot. So what kind of friendships, for example, would I create? Would I create links to like lonely people who are not hot in this network? Or do I uh, connect links to people who are in big non-hot communities, right? Or do I just randomly connect edges? So on that note, thank you for listening. On the incompleteness, we have, uh, we have had tutorials on this. So if you want to see like the three hour tutorial, um, there are slides up there um, that you can see. And we go into how do you correct some of the biases as well, which I didn't go here, uh, through here because there's a lot of math behind how do you actually correct some of the biases. And I'm happy to um, take questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. It was a very interesting talk. It was. Uh, we're, I, I think we're we're not used to getting such technical uh, technical presentations here, but I think there was a lot of learning that was going on. I, I had a question about um, when you were comparing the performance of the three methods when you were showing um, when when learning uh, was not possible or useful, when heuristics were optimal, and then where your algorithm was was uh, fun where it worked well. Uh, you were showing the means, I think. So what about some estimate of the variance? So is it, yes, you know what I mean? Yes, there was variance on there. Uh, let's see. I'm trying yeah. to see if I can actually, can I escape and go to, oh, yeah, escape and go to a particular. I just wasn't pressing it hard enough. Um, so this one here. Yeah. So there is variance oh, okay. for, for each one of these. So for so in particular, like for example, for the uh, block two level Erdős-Rényi uh, model, right? It's an ensemble of networks. So we uh, we sample a network from it, and then we run. I think these are over like ten trials each, uh, oh. where where we try to see um, you know how stable is the approach. So yeah, so we, we do track of, of the variance. And there are, there, there are interesting things where, for example, when we do look for um, bring nodes of this type into my network, um, there are times where we see a lot of variance up front. Up, right. By up front, I mean early on. In right. fact, here you see like the variance here is a little bit bigger. It gets a little smaller yeah. later on. Um, a lot of it has to do with basically um, are, are the features that you're using uh, able to capture the relational dependency yeah. that, that you have? Yeah, okay. good question. And then I have one more question. If yeah. if, okay. uh, so I, I think um, so the application of these kinds of methods, so uh, in, in our world, this is, this is where I see the application or one potential application. So we, we have data that is, uh, partially coming in based on, uh, you know, r random nodes. And then also there's a random walk from each node. So this is kind of like a, a, our normal partner services. So someone comes in, they're a new case, and then we might trace a couple of their partners. And so a question that we get from the field is, well, how should we, uh, which index case, given that there's only so much money, uh, which index cases should we be tracing extensively? And so, so we look at an index case that comes in. They have three partners. So should we do any tracing at all, number one? Number two, which of these partners is of the highest priority to, to follow, and, and how far should we keep going? And number three, uh, 
I think part of the, the issue here is what happens if we're not able to find the in any of these partners. So I think that's the case where like there's just no reward increment, right? So anyway, uh, what, so what do you think about the potential applications? Yeah, so that is interesting. So, uh, so the one thing uh, is that if you just have, in a way, these very small trees, right? So you're learning on these very, very small trees. Um, and so I can see that you, you so the, um, the attributes become a lot more, more interesting, right? The attributes on the person become a lot more interesting, unless you, you have like other information. In fact, this is why I added the second part that maybe uh, one can ask the person like which, which parties did you go to and who were there? Because then that could expand the, the, this little tree that you have, right? So if I, if I had a bunch of these small trees, what I would first do was, would be, given that the guy came to me, I would ask him certain questions where I could uh, expand um, the network and then try to do something like the network online learning on it. But if I just have like maybe, I don't know, uh, like 100 people and each one has only like three friends, um, then that becomes very, very difficult to learn, right? The whole idea with relational dependencies is that there's enough relations there for me to start learning, right? If there's not that many links, then I cannot learn anything, right? And I don't know, for example, how much attributes or information you have for each individual. I imagine that you have a lot, right? I imagine there's a survey or there's some dialogue that happens. I think, I think it can vary, and I think it, uh, it's just a case of, of extracting that data. If, if Raylene's on the phone, she might be able to provide more info. So. Yeah, so for example, how many of these, while well, we're waiting perhaps for others to come up with Question: How many of these um, how, how many of these trees do you have normally? Over over what time period? Uh, over, over a year? Yeah. Um, so in San Francisco, uh, you know, thousands, right? Like right. Thousands of many trees, and and some of them, the degree, the average degree isn't three. I mean, you're right. No, much I'm higher. And, I mean, some people are having twenty over a given yeah. week. Nope. The, there's probably very many over uh, over um, over a year or even within a month. So I was saying on the order of a thousand or to ten thousand. And so you don't have you do have um, heterogeneous degree distribution right. among them. So that so that's useful, right. right? You are you can learn on that. And I imagine that not all of their egoness is a star, right? Of what you have learned about them, that there are some triangles. Right. So that would be helpful, and that. Right. Go ahead. And well, and so with MSM, obviously, yes, stars, and with, with heterosexual stuff, obviously, squares, you know, so it's a little more complicated, but yeah. Right. And then, um, and so, um, again, if there's information about, like, oh, these people went to those parties, then you can add, you can make your network um, yeah. multiplex, right. right? And that, and that, uh, and that will give you more relational dependencies that could help in terms of learning about who to ask or yeah. who to go to. In terms of whom, whom, whom should we be investing, like yes. contact tracing resources? Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Pina. I'll have to say, about ninety percent of it was like, well, in terms of what I know and understand, but. Um, I'm thinking, um, you know, particularly with our contact networks, I don't think in contact tracing we ever ask people, well, what, what bars have you been frequenting right. recently? Uh, or where do you and your friends meet up? We do that in surveys, but when it comes to contact tracing kind of interviewing, we don't ask that kind of information. So that seems to me like one arena which we need to put some more thinking into. Uh, to do just what you said, expand the network first and then start doing some learning kind of processes on it. The second thing I thought of is I don't think we have been doing in the division, I mean other people in the field 
are working on this, but I don't think we have done any of online, like Grindr or Tinder kind of stuff. Whereas I think what you're talking about would lend itself very much to Grindr, Tinder types of connections. And we do know they play an increasingly more important role in people meeting sex partners. So we maybe need to be looking at that kind of thing. Yes, and actually that would be a good source of uh, training data as, as, as well in terms of like what features are important and, that, and like what weights those, do those features have that then you can transfer and apply to, for example, the data you're getting from San Francisco, right? Um, so that could help. And in fact, going back to your first uh, comment, that was why I added the high strength stuff at the end, uh, because knowing that, for example, these people frequent this particular bar um, sh would give you uh, a different type of connection that could be helpful in learning who to ask next, right? This idea that I have people and they go to these parties, whether they're bars or parks or whatever else. Um, the other thing I thought about is I think Matthew had sent us this article recently about group sex events. Am I right? Or Yeah. So uh, I think we have not been doing anything with group sex events other than kind of reading about it in the newspaper and going, oh, this is happening. This is interesting. Uh, we should be doing more about that because, again, my understanding is more and more of this stuff is happening and probably it plays an important role in STD transmission and spread. Mm -hmm. The other thing I thought of was, and I don't know whether you talked about this or not, but I think there is a lot of, I make my contacts on Tinder and then I bring it into my other contacts because you know I may meet somebody on Tinder or somebody's and then invite them to my group sex event and teach them about this really favorite bar they should come to. So um, there is a connecting of different types of networks to each other and having them move from one to the other and overlap, et cetera. I don't know whether you have done any yeah. thinking. Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. So we, we call those multi-layer networks, right? Where like, here's Tina in this environment, here's Tina in that environment, here's Tina in this other environment. And you can have multi-layer networks that evolve over time, obviously. Um, the big issue, um, I, I'll, I'll just leave this comment here about how do you deal with time is, is, is a big issue, right? Do you con is it continuous, is it discrete? Computer scientists usually discretize time because we say, do you want it fast or do you want it good? And you want it fast. So we're going to discretize it, right? So, but it, so then it's like Monday's data, Tuesday's data, Wednesday's data, right? That yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, but definitely this idea of um, trying to see if um, the information that you have from Tina in an online world, um, how useful is that to Tina on the offline world? And we know that there it tends to be a little bit of a difference, right? and taking that difference into account. So maybe like in an online world, uh, Tina is more shy than an offline world or, or reverse. Or vice versa. Yeah. Or vice versa, right. Um, and there was actually, so Mark Newman, uh, who's a very famous physicist at Michigan, I'm sure you guys probably uh, read his recent work on uh, online dating. So he got uh, a lot of data from one of the online dating sites I think it's match.com, but he would not confirm or deny it, um, in terms of like behavior of people on online dating networks and these pockets. And like, for example, for a um, black a female to compete with a white female on these networks, I believe he was saying that the black female has to be like 15 years younger, something like that. And, I haven't seen that work. We should yeah, look at that. Yeah, they're really. He has. He's. Uh, he, and he's a great speaker too. Um, I can send you his paper. So he did this really nice online study of. Uh, well, a study of online dating data that he had, and these pockets that like um, uh, of of dating that 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 come about like here in like South Dakota. Maybe there was some fracking going on, and that's why like there are all yeah. that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. 
I'm going to stop there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Peter. Thank you. Thank you, guys.